have a seat. Amen and praise the Lord. It is so good to see you in the Lord's house today on this Palm Sunday. And I'm excited about everything that's going to be happening this week at Quail Springs Baptist Church leading up to Easter Sunday and our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ next Sunday morning. So I want to encourage you to do something. On your way out today, you'll find some things that we have just to help you to pray and to get ready uh, for Easter Sunday. One of the things I'd love for you to do is to pick up some of these invite cards that say Find Hope. And they have the schedule for what's going to be happening this coming week with Good Friday services right here on Friday, April 7th at 6.30. We're going to be talking about the seven last words of Jesus from the cross of Calvary. You don't want to miss that service. It's going to be a great time, but it's also a great time for you to invite. And then our Easter services next Sunday, 8, 15, 9, 30, and 11. Take as many of these as you will share and share them with friends and family members, people in your neighborhood, people who you can invite. There are people who will come at your invitation at Easter who might not come to hear the gospel at church any other time of year. But I promise you, if you bring them here, if you invite them here, they will have opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus and to trust Jesus as Savior. So invite people to come. And then also today, I am so thrilled that we're going to be able to gather around the Lord's table near the end of our service today. And as Quail Springs Baptist Church gathers together for the Lord's Supper, we invite everyone who's trusted Jesus Christ as Savior and followed Him in believer's baptism to join with us. And that reminds me, as I talk about believer's baptism, last Sunday, what an incredible day on Baptism Sunday. After all was said and done, 30 people followed Jesus Christ in believer's baptism at Quail Springs Baptist Church. Praise God for that. Man, I thank God for every one of those people. And, uh, and there are more. Uh, there are more who are going to be baptized today and in the weeks to come. And so we just praise the Lord for that. This morning, I want you to take your Bible. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 31 through 43 this morning. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 43. Have you ever wondered what makes one person open to what God wants to say to them while another person is very closed to what God wants to say to them? You can imagine two people sitting next to one another in church on Sunday, Matthew and Sarah, and as they sit there, they're hearing the same message, the same songs, they're in the same service, but the response is very, very different. Sarah is receptive. She's attentive. She's open to what God wants to say to her. And Matthew is really closed and apathetic and just sort of bored by everything. What, what makes the difference? Why the different response? Well, I think one major factor is one simple word, and that is the word expectancy. When we're expecting God to speak, when we're expecting God to move, when we're expecting to hear God and, and for God to work in our hearts, then we tend to experience what we expect. If you come with an open heart for God to speak, then you'll hear God speak. On the other hand, if you're not expecting anything from God, if you're not expecting to hear Him, if you're not expecting Him to do anything in your life, then you'll probably experience what you're expecting. And so when we have an expectant type of faith, God honors that expectancy. And yet many people are finding reasons to lose an expectant faith in God. Some of the things that we've seen in the past week, mass murderers attacking schools, such as what happened this past week in the Covenant School in Nashville, with three nine-year-old children and three adults losing their lives so tragically. And I, I'm praying for those families. I just want us to, to mention their names in this service today because we need to be praying for them. Those three nine-year-old children, Evelyn Dickhouse and Hallie Scruggs and William Kenny, three little children who lost their lives. And then the head of the school, Catherine Kuntz, and a substitute teacher, Cynthia Peake, and a custodian, Mike Hill, 
all lost their lives. And when things like that happen, it can cause someone to begin to doubt or to lose an expectant faith in the Lord. Not, not only those kinds of things, but natural things that happen, whether it's hurricanes or earthquakes or floods or tornadoes or fires that devastate communities as they sweep through. That can cause people to lose an expectancy and faith in God. And then there are other issues, whether it's debt or unemployment or our health or our security. All of those things can cause us to lose our faith and to set us on edge. One of the things I'm seeing increasingly in our world, we are just all on edge. Studies show that Americans are the most stressed people on the planet. Many people have lost their faith in God if they ever had faith to begin with. Pew Research studies have found that the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, the nuns, people who self-identify as atheists or agnostics or who say they just don't have any faith at all in anything, the nuns make up 25% of American adults. And then in addition to the nuns, there's a group of people that we might call the duns. And those are people who identify as Christians and maybe grew up in church, but they've been burnt. And while they may have some good things to say about Jesus, they've walked away from the church, they've walked away from the Bible, they've walked away from any kind of active, expectant faith. They're over it. They say, I'm done. And so whether you're a nun or whether you're a dun or whether you're just going through life and struggling with your faith. Here's what God would say to every one of us today. God wants us to live every day of our lives with an expectant faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus will give us the grace so that we can live with expectancy in what he's going to do. That's what we're going to look at today in the Word of God. We're going to see how Jesus Christ works in our lives to awaken an expectant faith in us. I want us to stand to our feet as we read together Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 31. And we're standing in honor of the reading of God's word. Notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse 31 of Luke 18. And taking the twelve, Jesus said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. As he drew near to Jerusalem, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. This is the word of God. Join with me as we pray. Lord God, I thank you for your word today. Thank you, Jesus, that we can live with an expectant faith in you. God, show us today what that looks like and what that means for us. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in everything that is said and done and even in the thoughts that we think. Lord God, be glorified and we'll give you glory for we pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And brothers and sisters, if you agree with that prayer, will you say amen? Amen. You may be seated. As we look at this passage of Scripture, I want to talk to you about four qualities of expectant faith. Four qualities of expectant faith in Jesus Christ. The first thing I want you to see in this text is what expectant faith realizes. What expectant faith realizes. Now look in verses 31 through 33. The Bible shows us that Jesus is getting closer and closer to the city of Jerusalem. And soon he's going to enter the city and as he enters what you saw the children reenact for us today is the same thing that happened 
when Jesus came into that city. Multitudes were there, lining the city streets, shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And they were waving those palm branches and they were worshiping him. And then, a few days later, other voices in the same city would cry out, crucify him. All of that would happen in the city of Jerusalem. On this day, though, that we read about, Jesus is telling his disciples ahead of time what it's going to happen. And notice what he says in verse 31. He says, everything that is written about the Son of Man and the prophets will be accomplished. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. Now, Son of Man, you might want to just underline that phrase because that's a name that Jesus gave to himself. It wasn't a title that other people gave to him. It's a title that Jesus used for himself, Son of Man. And though it may seem sort of counterintuitive to us, the phrase or the title Son of Man speaks to the deity and the divinity of Jesus Christ. It goes back to the Old Testament prophet Daniel, where Daniel had a vision of God who Daniel called the Ancient of Days. And there in Daniel chapter 7, God, the Ancient of Days, gives authority and glory and sovereign power to the Son of Man. This person, who we know as Jesus, appears before Almighty God, and Almighty God gives the Son of Man His authority, His glory, and His sovereign power. So when Jesus was calling Himself the Son of Man, He was asserting His own identity, His own sovereignty as God. And so He says, When I get to Jerusalem in just a few days, everything that's been prophesied concerning the Son of Man is going to happen. This was the third explicit prediction about his death that Jesus had given his disciples. And this was by far the most specific. He promised seven events would happen to him when he got to Jerusalem. Look in verse 32. Number one, he would be turned over to the Gentiles. First King Herod and then Pilate and then the Roman soldiers. Secondly, he would be mocked. Thirdly, he would be shamefully treated. Fourthly, even more specifically, he would be spit upon. Verse 33. Number five, he would be flogged and beaten with a whip. Six, he would be killed. And then miraculously, unexpectedly, he would rise from the dead after the third day. Praise God. Jesus predicted all of these things about himself, and the language that he uses here points even more powerfully to his own sovereignty and his own power as God. Look at how he says, on the third day, he would rise again. Literally, he said in the original language, on the third day, he will raise himself up. Jesus was calling his own shot. He was saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. Here's what's going to happen. And though it may look like other people are in control, I'm going to be in control. And after I have been killed and buried, on the third day, I will rise up. Expectant faith realizes that Jesus Christ can do anything. I want to ask you today, do you realize that Jesus Christ can do anything? He has the power to call his own shots. When the New York Yankees were playing the Chicago Cubs in the 1932 World Series, at Game 3 at Wrigley Field in Chicago, Babe Ruth, the home run king, stepped up to the plate to hit. By this time, Babe Ruth was near the end of his career with the Yankees. He was probably no longer at the very top of his game. In the fifth inning, the score was tied 4-4. to Babe Ruth took strike one from the Cubs pitcher. The Cubs players and fans were all making fun of him, hurling insults at him. And before the next pitch, Babe Ruth raised his hand and pointed out to center field. And then came the next pitch, strike two, more jeers from the Cubs. And once again, unmistakably, Babe Ruth pointed to the flagpole at center field. The next pitch was a curveball. With a crack of the bat, 
Babe Ruth connected. He hit the ball over 440 feet just to the right of that flagpole at center field. As the announcer shouted, the ball is going, going, going high into the center field stands, and it is a home run. The Yankees went crazy. They wound up winning the game. Babe Ruth's home run was spectacular, but what was even more impressive, he called his shot. He said, I'm going to hit it right there, and then he hit it right there. He did exactly what he said he was going to do. In an infinitely more miraculous way, Jesus Christ called his shot. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And then I'm going to raise myself up from the dead just as it has been prophesied. Expectant faith realizes Jesus Christ can do anything. And Jesus' very specific prophecies here echo the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. Psalm 41 verse 9 promised that the Messiah would be betrayed. It says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Psalm 22 verses 16 through 18 promises very specifically how the Messiah would die. It says, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Psalm 16 verse 10 promised that the Messiah would not remain in the grave. It was a promise of the resurrection. There the Bible says, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, the grave, or let your Holy One see corruption. All of these prophecies and even Jesus' own word about what he would do. And yet, even as the Lord's disciples heard, they did not realize the truth of what Jesus was telling them. Look in verse 34 of the text. But they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. The disciples, those closest to Jesus, simply didn't have room in their minds to realize what Jesus was going to do. They were looking for the Messiah to come and to conquer. They could not imagine that he would come and suffer and die. And rising from the dead was beyond the scope of their imagination. But listen, when it comes to Jesus and his ability, nothing should be beyond the scope of your imagination or my imagination. Expectant faith realizes that Jesus can do anything. I want to ask you this question today. Are you willing to let him call the shots in your life? Are you willing to allow him to do whatever he wants to do and just to come to him with expectant faith and say, Jesus, I believe you can do anything. And so I'm trusting you with the impossible in my life. We see what expectant faith realizes. Secondly, consider with me what expectant faith risks. What expectant faith risks. Now look in verses 35 through 39. As he continues his journey, Jesus passed through the city of Jericho. Jericho was 18 miles from Jerusalem. And there were, and even today still are, two cities of Jericho. They're right next to one another, side by side. There's the old city, now in ruins, that was destroyed by the Lord during the time of Joshua in the Old Testament. And then there's a newer city, a city rebuilt by Herod the Great, right next to it. And I tell you that because Matthew and Mark say that Jesus healed a blind man as he was leaving Jericho, while Luke says that the healing happened as he entered the city. And the best solution, I believe, is that the healing happened as Jesus left the old area of the city and then moved into the new area of the city. And there was a blind man there. Mark tells us his name. Luke doesn't, but Mark tells us that his name was Bartimaeus. And the Bible says that he began to plead with Jesus to be healed. He found out who it was. It was Jesus of Nazareth passing by. And the Bible says Bartimaeus cried out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The biblical language indicates that he kept repeating that request over and over again. Jesus, son of David, have mercy 
on me. People began to try to hush him up. They said, Bartimaeus, be quiet. Bartimaeus, you're making a scene. Bartimaeus, you're distracting everyone from what Jesus is trying to do. But the Bible says he cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. No one could control Bartimaeus. Why? Because he had expectant faith in Jesus. And he was risk-taking, relentless, risking everything to call out Jesus to help him. It reminds me of what God the Father promises in Jeremiah 29 verse 13. God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll never forget something that a guest preacher at our church did one time when I was a kid. Right before the regular church service started, he had all the children come forward and we were sitting on maybe the first two or three rows of the church. And he stood in front of us and he said, having faith in God and placing faith in God is just believing that God offers you something and then receiving it from him. Then he reached into his pocket and pulled out a $5 bill. He said, it's like me having this $5 bill and saying, anybody who reaches out and takes this $5 bill can have it. He said, that's what faith is like. It's just like, like me saying, anybody who reaches out and takes this $5 bill can have it. And then he said it again, anybody who reaches out and takes this $5 bill can have it. And we all just sort of sat there. Until finally one of the older kids, David, stepped out from, he was in the last row of our little group. He stepped out, reached out, grabbed that $5 bill, shoved it in his pocket, went back to his seat. And the preacher said, that's exactly how it is. It's simply taking and receiving what God offers you. That's what faith is. I've thought about that illustration ever since then. It made an impact on me. Mainly, I wish that I'd been risky enough to jump out and take that $5 bill. But that's how it works. God offers us his gift of salvation, his gift of grace, his gift of taking care of the needs in our lives. And by faith, we reach out and we receive it. Blind Bartimaeus saw something that a lot of people with 20-20 vision can't see. When you're in the presence of Jesus, it's worth taking the risk, the risk of faith to call on him expecting that he will hear and he will answer. And some of you are here and, and you've just sort of become really timid about asking God for anything. I don't know why. Maybe because you've been disappointed in the past or maybe because you really doubt that God can do anything or maybe you wonder if God really cares about you or if he sees you. But just like Bartimaeus called out and said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You can call on Jesus and he will hear and he will answer. There's a third thing that I want you to see about expectant faith in this text. Number three, think with me about what expectant faith requests. What expectant faith requests? Look in verses 40 and 41. In verse 40, Jesus stopped and he asked for Bartimaeus to be brought close to him. And then he asked Bartimaeus a beautiful question. He simply said this, what do you want me to do for you? Don't walk past that question. What do you want me to do for you? Think about where Jesus was headed. He was 18 miles away from Jerusalem. 18 miles away from where he knew he would be mistreated, he would be arrested, he would be beaten, he would be nailed to a cross, he would be buried in the ground. He knew that his death was just 18 miles away. An ordinary person would have been so preoccupied with what was right in front of them, all of that suffering, that it would have been impossible for them to think about anybody else or anybody else's need, not Jesus. His circumstance, his feelings, his schedule never diminished his compassion and his mercy for others. And so he asked the question, what do you want me to do for you? And suddenly Bartimaeus had the opportunity of a lifetime. He was trapped in a prison of his own blindness, darkness from which there was no escape and no relief. And so with expectant faith, he requested something impossible. Lord, let me recover my sight. I love that, quest, that request. He didn't say, Lord, I'd just like to, I'd, I'd like to receive a little bit more when I'm out here begging. If they could just give me a little bit more. That's not what he said. Lord, I just wish I had somebody to help me around because I'm blind. That's not what he prayed for. He prayed for his greatest need. 
Lord, let me recover my sight. Recently, I was speaking for a conference in California. There was also a large meeting sponsored by the California State University Center on Disabilities. And signs throughout the convention center said, Assistive Technology Conference. And that's what it was. It was a, a technology conference for people with disabilities, just pieces of technology, equipment, and all kinds of things to assist them. And Michelle and I noticed many, many, many blind people there. And all kinds of devices and technologies to help them adapt to their blindness. I was studying this passage of scripture while we were there. And I began to imagine if Jesus showed up at a conference like this. If he showed up physically at this conference. Where so many people were blind. And if he were to ask each of them. And, and in, a, in a personal way just come up to each of them and say. What do you want me to do for you? I think without exception, the response you would have heard over and over again was the same thing that Bartimaeus said, Lord, let me recover my sight. That's what Bartimaeus said. What would you say? What would you say? What do you do when the one who can do anything asks, what do you want me to do for you? Sometimes, we cling to whatever we're using to assist us in our pain or our hurt or our need rather than requesting Jesus to help. I believe that Jesus is in this place today. Do you believe that? And I believe that he would ask every one of us the same question he asked Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Right now, if Jesus asked you that question, what would you say? You might say, Lord, take away this emotional pain from my past. Lord, bring my prodigal son or daughter or friend back home. Or Lord, give me a job. Or Lord, heal my body. Or Lord, make my marriage happy again. Or Lord, bring peace back to our family because we just don't have any peace at home. Or, Lord, help me to keep from losing my temper with the people that I care about the most. Right now in your mind and your heart, take a moment and, and just think about what you would say if Jesus asked you, what do you want me to do for you? And be specific. Don't just say, well, Lord, bless me. Don't just say, Lord, make me stronger. No, be specific about something in your life. And don't let the impossible keep you from making your request because Jesus is more than able to accomplish the impossible. Like Bartimaeus, you and I need Jesus' help today and so we can ask for it with expectant faith. And then I want you to notice finally in this text, notice what expectant faith receives. Notice what expectant faith receives. Look in verses 42 and 43. In verse 42, Jesus said to Bartimaeus, recover your sight. Literally, in, in the original language, he just said one word. He just said, see. <laughs> Bartimaeus said, Lord, I want to recover my sight. And Jesus said, see. It only took one word from his lips to accomplish a miracle in Bartimaeus' life. Lord, I want to see. Jesus said, see. And suddenly he could see. The Lord told Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well, literally, your faith has saved you. Notice Bartimaeus' response. The Bible says he received his sight. And then it says he followed Jesus. And then it says he praised God and other people with him praised God as well. Because when Jesus brought sight to that blind man, the people recognized this is the Messiah. In all of the Old Testament, never was a blind person healed. And given their vision, not one time. And so the people of Israel began to, to, to believe that when the Messiah came, that one of the signs that he was the Messiah was that he would bring sight to the blind. The Bible talks about it in Isaiah 29, verse 18, where the Bible says, In that day, in the day of the Messiah, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. Isaiah 35 verse 5 promises something similar. Then when the Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. 
Expectant faith, listen. Expectant faith receives exactly what Jesus wants you to receive. When you have expectant faith, you're expecting to receive exactly what Jesus wants you to receive. What if Jesus had told Bartimaeus no? Then he also would have given him grace to understand why no was the best answer. One of the most inspiring stories of expectant faith that I've heard in a long time is the story of Jake Olson. Jake Olson played long snapper for the University of Southern California Trojans. On September 2nd, 2017, Jake made history when he became the first blind college player ever to take the field in USC's game against Western Michigan. I want to talk to you about what happened in Jake's life early on in his life. When he was eight months old, Jake was diagnosed with a rare form of eye cancer called retinoblastoma. It left him with cancerous tumors in both eyes. His left eye was removed at 10 months old, and then he immediately became, began chemotherapy and cryotherapy to save his right eye. Miraculously, Jake's doctors were able to save his right eye. And for 12 years, that single right eye showed Jake his entire world. The cancer returned eight times. Each time, Jake was able to beat it. And then in September 2009, when Jake was 12, the cancer returned once more. This time, the doctor said, there's no other viable options for treatment. And the safest course of action to keep the cancer for, from spreading was to remove Jake's other eye. If you knew that you only had a limited number of days to see anything, what would you want to see? What would you want to look at if, if you knew that you only had just a limited number of days and they're going to take out your eye, the only eye that you have, and, and that's it. You won't see anything. Here's what 12-year-old Jake did. He went and watched USC games and practices. He went with his dad and one of his best friends and his best friend's dad, and he played Pebble Beach Golf Course because that was one of his dreams. With five days left before the surgery that would take his eyesight, he took every opportunity just to look at the people he cared about most. He said, Dad, I want to look at you. Mom, I want to look at you. Other family members, he just looked at them, just wanted to look at them because he knew he wouldn't be able to see them again. His surgery was in early November. And Jake's final request was for the house to be decorated for Christmas early so that he could see the lights and the decorations one last time. And then the day came of his surgery. As they were traveling to the hospital, Jake put his face against the window and he looked out realizing this would be the last time he would see the world. From underneath his glasses, tears were streaming down Jake's cheeks. He looked to one side of the car, then he looked to the other. And it was more than his mom and dad could bear to watch. And yet through it all, before, during, and after that surgery, Jake continued to live with a deep faith in Jesus Christ. Jake's mom, Cindy, says this about Jake's faith. She says, just to see his spirit grow, not shrink through these trials, is a testimony to Jake's willingness to grow in his relationship with Christ. That's what his mom said. Listen to what Jake says. Jake says, God always has a plan. It may not be our plan, but it's always the best plan. Let me tell you what that is. That's expectant faith in God. And when you have that kind of faith, then you'll receive whatever God has for you. And whatever he has for you is always the best. And so as we come to the Lord's table today, I want to encourage you to come with expectant faith, remembering 
what Jesus Christ did for you. He took every step all the way to Calvary for you. His body was pierced and fastened to the cross for you. Blood flowed from his head and his hands and his feet and his side for you. And you can come to him with expectant faith like Bartimaeus did and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And in expectant faith, you can hear his question to you. What do you want me to do for you? As we gather at the Lord's table today, what do you want Jesus Christ to do for you? He will work in your life as you come to him with expectant faith. Thank you.